Welcome to the Elliot Hulse Podcast. Podcast. I am the king of making men strong. Shedding of the old man, right? The way we can freely walk into rising, ascending, cleansing, sanctifying our souls for it's, it's the Yo Elliot Dime. Show. Dime. Yo, we're back with the Yo Elliot Show, y'all. And uh, so we're doing things a little different here today. I'm filming from my house. And so uh, it's just going to be a little bit different. Hopefully it goes smooth. We're going live. I'll have the recording. And I got a guest today that I met several years ago when I was introduced to this realm of men, masculine excellence, I guess you could say. Men waking up to certain... um, certain ideals that were pro- probably hidden from us for many generations. Uh, his name is Richard Cooper. Richard, thanks for joining us. Oh, it's good to see you again, man. Yeah, it's cool that we've, you know, you were the first guy that, uh, honestly, the first guy that I came across in this realm. One of my friends who was a, who's a musician and dealt with a lot of women, a lot of crazy women. And uh, one day he saw a video of mine where I was just answering questions about MGTOW and Red Pill on YouTube. Really didn't know much about it, but I kind of explored and was trying to learn a little bit. And he was like, you got to check out this guy, Rich Cooper, he sent me a YouTube channel. And uh, to be honest, you enlightened me to a lot of things that uh, I wasn't consciously aware of. And so I really appreciate you know what you do. Uh, today, you also have a, a book out, right? The Unplugged Alpha? Yeah, The Unplugged Alpha. Yeah, it's been out on Amazon for a couple of years now. It's done real well. Cool, man. Yeah, so it's pretty cool to see the work that you're doing. I do appreciate your message. Um, Today, I'd like to dive into a section of your book that recovers 20 red flags that you propose men should be aware of when vetting women for a relationship. But, you know, before we unpack that, I think it would be important for us to, uh, you know, speak about the obvious red flag, I guess, or elephant in the room, uh, mainly in regards to our different experiences and convictions about marriage um you know you were dragged through uh divorce court and uh you know definitely had some bad experiences with marriage and i could totally see uh that happening in the lives of many 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 men today and i think they need a voice like yours i married young and stayed married came from an intact family uh, had you know only great examples of what a marriage looks like and love being married and uh and, and i promote it and i propose that, that you know it's a good thing um, but I can't argue with your experience and what you share. So, you know, the whole question about uh, marriage itself can get kind of sticky because, of course, we have the bastardized version of marriage, which is a state sponsorship, weaponization of sexuality, uh, you know, men and women, and how it's really destroyed marriage. And then perhaps, and this is kind of like where my question goes, uh, perhaps the the calling to and rising above our primal instincts as men and women to unify in a monogamous relationship. Where do you stand? I guess my question really is, uh, do you believe that men are designed to follow our primal instincts uh, for, you know, having as much sex with as many women as possible? Or, you know, do we have a noble and divine calling for sexual mastery and that it's better to maybe master our sexual instinct within the boundaries of monogamy. Um, I'm more, see, uh, I've looked at it from different angles, you know, at this point. And when we last talked, it was several years ago. When was it, 2018 or 19? Maybe, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I know you've you've been married for a long time. You're happily married. And you, sorry, just to correct the statement, I didn't get dragged through the divorce court. I know that sometimes people um, misunderstand uh, divorce and how it works. You don't necessarily have to go to court and it's ideal not to, if you want to mm. get an ideal outcome and remedy. So everything I did with my ex-wife was subtle outside of that through negotiation back and forth with lawyers. And that takes time, but, um, I'm not a big fan of marriage as an institution because it invites the state into your home and mm. it allows, and as a libertarian, like as a sovereign man, I don't want the government telling me what I can and can't do. I don't want them telling me what I can and can't do with my wealth, 
uh, access to my children, any of these things. So it works out for some, for some guys, for, for many guys, it really doesn't. Um, it's amazing that you and your wife have been together for this long. You've got four great children out of the whole deal. And we were talking off air before about how that's going. And I'm, I'm stoked for you, brother. Like I'm very happy for you, but the path that I'm at is at, at my life, um, and the stage that I'm at, I've got a kid that I've got to finish raising. Obviously, um, I'm divorced. I'm out the other side, clean. I uh, got a great girlfriend. Uh, we've been together for a few, few years now. She's uh, she's a wonderful complement to my life. You know, she adds value. She does a lot to improve it. She does a lot to improve my kid's life. She's great with my family. I just don't see the need to invite the state in my life and declare in front of a church or in front of family that I uh, put this ring on her finger and want to be with her forever and ever until kingdom come because I know how things work. Um, there's a lot of lyrics that you hear tossed around. She's not yours. It's just your turn, blah, blah, blah sort of thing. And I think that men have a innate need to scatter seed. That's, that's why we can produce millions of sperm per month and women only can produce one egg. That's just a reality of the sexes. Men and women are not the same. They're different. You already know that. I think most of your audience already knows and agrees with that. Whether you choose to be monogamous or to be non-monogamous, that's your choice. Um, when you take a look at the evidence and the way that humans have arrived at where we're at today, some choose a spiritual path and they want to declare monogamy and uh, tune into that part of life. And that's cool. And others uh, don't. And that's cool too. As long as you're putting yourself first and you're getting the results out of life that you want and you're not hurting anybody, I don't see anything wrong with either path. Okay. Yeah, I can totally dig what you're saying there. You know, as far as not hurting anyone else, I'm curious, like, so we both agree that the sexual revolution, uh, at least I think we agree, uh, has been a scourge upon humanity. Uh, a big part of what allowed the sexual revolution to unfold, which has given us you know, a lot of the mess that we have right now, has been the uh, the advent of contraception, mainly uh, birth control pills. You know, if we're kind of like wanting to live based on our instinct, right, and do like you know what our primal nature is. What are your thoughts on uh, on contraception and it's a means by which we've fallen into this mess? Yeah, uh, hormonal birth control seems to be the catalyst that has contributed to a lot of the results that we have in society today, decades later now, right? Um, because before there was, there was a very real problem or risk that if a woman was promiscuous, that she could end up pregnant. And if you end up pregnant and you don't have, uh, a provider to protect you and the child, then chances weren't very good for survival. A lot of that's changed now though. We have the government who's now, you know, big daddy, you know, the mm -hmm. head of the household, you know, in many cases it's, you know, that's why divorce law introduces itself into your life. You know, when you get married or if you have to untie the knot. You don't have a lot of control. You still have responsibility as a man under the rule of the government, but you don't have a lot of authority in your own household when you invite them in. So the advent of hormonal birth control has given women freedom to do as they choose. It's, uh, you know, with the access to safe and effective abortions, as they call it, it gives them the ability to terminate pregnancies, even if the hormonal birth control doesn't work or they forget to take it or they're lazy with taking it or whatever it happens to be. But there's not a lot of consequences for bad choices anymore. A lot of things are forgiven. Oh, take this pill if you want to have free sex. Oh, have an abortion if the free sex doesn't work out. Oh, you can't afford the kid that you have. That's fine. The government will, you know, uh, step in and take care of things. Um, oh, there's a guy that you can extract resources from. Family law will step in and, and, and steal from him and alienate him from his own children. So there's a lot of weird things that happen as a consequence of giving, giving women... <sighs> free reign to sleep with as many guys as much as they want in a fairly safe fashion. And that's, in my view, one of the great contributors and failures to society at the same time, why we're here today. Yeah. Well, what, what are your thoughts on a male's responsibility to, you know, turn away from that and not participate in it by having, you know, sterile transient sex with, you know, dozens of women who, you know, obviously are sterile. Yeah. Do we just, you know, kind of indulge? It's like, hey, there it's free sex. Let's just take it, take the bait. Or do we have a responsibility yeah. knowing what we do now to say no? It's it, it seems like indulge is is the path most chosen, you know, at this stage. Right. Mm -hmm. It's women have been promiscuous, you know, what are you gonna do? Like one of the things that I've heard critics say is, 
well, it's it's men's fault that women are like this today. You know, if 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 women are sluts, then men are are sluts make are slut makers for creating the promiscuity that exists. Because if men didn't indulge with women, then they wouldn't be promiscuous. But I don't think you're going to change a man's nature. He sees a beautiful woman with curves, he's going to want to indulge. It's always been that way. Self control is the new conversation that you're bringing up, where it's like you know if you subscribe to a certain belief or an organized religion that prescribes certain behaviors or lifestyle choices, then you're encouraged to follow those. But guys find, well, my, you know, my biological drive is still to indulge because why shouldn't I, you know, she's indulging, other guys are indulging. Why can't I indulge sort of thing? Um, so there's a lot of different paths that you can go down it, but to the point of the original question, it seems like most men have chosen to indulge. And when I say most, I'd say the vast majority of the population, including women. So it's like, right. you're not going to turn the clock back and all of a sudden stop indulging in women uh, because men just won't um, and women won't because they get the free attention. They've had this for decades now. I don't think you're, I don't think you can put the genie back in the bottle if you know what I'm saying, right? Like this is out now. This is where we're at. How do you now navigate it so that it best serves you? Yeah, I, I can definitely see what you're saying. Um, just playing a thought experiment, right? So, you know, uh, the laws have been designed to hurt men in terms of marriage. You know, I, I won't argue with that. I can see it. It's very obvious. It's it go, it's stacked against us. Um, what if there was a proposed law that we could band together and pass that would eliminate birth control like do we have a responsibility to do that as men to say that if we're gonna if the genie is out well we have a we are in control we do have power um the same way that they got the power to vote and to do all these other things that you know kind of screwed us uh could we if we could should we do away with it well the the if we could question starts to lean into other areas as well because you hear guys saying if we could repeal the 19th amendment then women then women couldn't vote and we wouldn't end up with bad political choices and wars and you know uh that's why i say experiment you know yeah you know like you could cook up a whole bunch of ideas that could potentially solve everything i don't think you're gonna how can i put this i don't think that you're gonna find i mean if women accepted that you took away the birth control pills let's just say they did I don't think that last several decades, what was it, 1960s, 1970s? I mean, it's been 50 years. Let's just call it about 50 years. I don't think the last 50 years of cultural programming, societal programming are going to make women uh, chest virgins again. They're, they're not just going to get right with any anybody or anything and say, I'm not going to sleep with anybody until marriage now. Right? I don't think that you can do that. I mean, if you slept with 50, if you shared your body, if you've laid with 50, 100 men, mm-hmm. you can't all of a sudden declare... Well, I'm going to remain chaste until my wedding day. Right. Because those 50, men have imprinted on her. They've done things to her. She's carrying baggage around now as a result of that. So I don't see that repairing the problem. Sure. Yeah, it, it took three generations to get here. <laughs> At least three generations. Right. It, it'll, it might take more to reverse it. Yeah, I think, it, I think it's going to keep going in the direction that it's going. I don't think mm-hmm. that we're going to turn back the clock and end up closer to where we started back in the 60s Mm -hmm. if that makes Mm -hmm. sense Mm -hmm. very cool all right well yeah i just wanted to bring that up um i think it's important you know i you got a lot of really good points uh and i enjoy your book there's a lot of things in there i think men should read and um and would benefit greatly from uh particularly your fourth chapter and so we're going to deal with women either way, right? We want to hedge our bets, right? So, like, hey, unless we're going to unless we're going to swear them off, what are your thoughts on MGTOW? Do you think men should uh, swear women off completely, or uh, we should get involved? Maybe for a period of time, if you got to heal yourself, you know, you've got some wounds from past choices from a bad relationship, and you need a little bit of a break. Sure, um, it's a town that I would recommend guys visit, but I wouldn't suggest that they live there. I covered MGTOW in a chapter in my book, and I think that it's like like the notion or the idea has been hijacked by guys that aren't really choosing to go their own way today. A lot of them are kind of sent their own way, but they're calling it a choice. And 
if you have options, then it's a choice. If you don't have options and you're sent, then it's more quitting than anything. Yeah, we could definitely see that. What are your thoughts? Could just kind of playing playing some ideas here. Uh, so there's what they call incels, right? These guys who have chosen, uh, who have no choice. They're involuntary celibate. Do you? I, I have a friend that uses the term weaponized chastity. What are your thoughts on men saying no as a means by which to you know regain our ground in this uh, in this sort of battle with the sexes? Men. Uh, swearing off women as far as sexual intimacy? Yeah, as a means of weaponizing our, you know, taking back our power in a way, right? Like, so there's two different schools of thoughts, right? From what I understand, yeah. there's a the guy who's like, the, the world is burning, let's just get what we can get while it's falling apart and, you know, have a bunch of fun and, and, you know, and, and let it be, which, you know, quite cool. Uh, then those who are like, no, we've got to do something about it. And the first place we can begin is by denying women uh, the means by which they gain most power over men, which is sex and just saying no. Yeah. So, so there's incels, you know, I suppose, which are the involuntary celibates who want to be intimate, but don't get it. And then there's maybe guys that volunteer celibacy as well, but that would take the entire population of men to subscribe to that for it to be effective. And I don't see that happening either. <laughs> right. Okay, cool. So we're, we're doing it. We're diving in. We're going to deal with women. <clears throat> uh, intentions aside, there are things that you ought to know, right? Which I didn't know. You know, I, I could never sit up here and say that, you know, I made these great intentional choices about my wife. I was lucky. I, I can't say yeah. it any other way. I was lucky to have my parents who gave a model for us. Um, I was lucky that she's the type of woman that she is. I, you know, I, honestly, I was a teenager just trying to get some. Turns out that, you know, after learning about a lot of what I seen in your videos, reading your book and guys like you, uh, I didn't really have to go and fix anything. I looked and I was like, oh, no wonder why it works for me. And it was kind of like enlightened right. me to what already was. It's not going to be the case for most guys, nor do I, you know, make any illusions that it would be. So there are 20 things that you propose men should look for, be aware of, be, be mm -hmm. privy to in regards to women. And I'd love to go through each one of them briefly with you. Uh, the very first red flag, which is a term we hear all the time, but maybe I, maybe guys, people don't understand what it means. Red flag number one is avoid a woman with daddy issues. What exactly does that mean? Yeah. So if a woman doesn't have a good relationship with a strong, virtuous man in her life, ideally her father, maybe if her father passed on when she was small, grandfather or an uncle, then she's often going to have a fear of abandonment tied into things like borderline personality disorder. And they often act out in such a way that it ensures that awful things happen. Um, one of the things that I strongly recommend guys do when vetting a woman for anything on a long-term basis, whether it's dating or to raise children together, is make sure you're dealing with a woman that has a good relationship with her dad. Some people get mad at that. You know, they'll say, well, my dad was a bum or he ran off or, you know, whatever the story may be. And I always encourage people to try and contact your father, you know, if he's still around and get into the story before you believe, you know, the narrative that might have been sold to you by some of the women in your family. Um, he might have been an all right guy and he might have got pushed out of the household and he might want right. to have a relationship with you. So, um, it's something to, to consider and understand. And if a woman's doing the work on it, you know, she's going through some form of therapy to deal with whatever daddy issue she might have or resentment she might have towards men, anger, any of those things. Cool. Um, it's definitely a red flag, but you want to pay attention to it and be aware of it. That's a really good point. You know, I, I would go one step further and ask, what about girls that have dads that made them into princesses? Right, daddy's little girl could never do any wrong. She adores daddy. Um, doesn't have any problems with dad, but dad was kind of a you know a pushover. How do we spot that in a woman? Where does that kind of show up in her personality so that we can say, hey, oh, she loves her dad, yeah, but her dad's a, yeah, you know, a daughter sin. Yeah, that's a good point. So a pushover dad is the kind of guy that she will run as, as she's an adult. So I'll give an example. I got a friend that's. Uh, Married a very successful professional woman. Uh, father's in the picture, has always been in the picture. He's, you know, he's a good dude. You know, he's a nice guy. Um, you know, he's a, uh, 
he, he's your quintessential uh, Robert Glover nice guy, right? Um, and there's a difference between a nice guy and a kind man. You know, you guys can dig through that when you get to Robert Glover's No More Mr. Nice Guy book. Um, but because mom ran him in the household and he was, um, he was basic. I mean, I don't want to use the word slave, but he behaved a lot like a slave. He's at her beck and call for every single thing. I mean, she's an adult woman. She's in her thirties. He's in his retirement years. He's not in the best of health, but when she says jump, he says, how high I need a picture hung shows up and does it. Need a chandelier put together, shows up and does it. Um, these, the, these pushover men rest assured. Um, it's another version of daddy issues. Uh, she's going to try to pull that with you in a long-term relationship or a marriage. She's going to try to run you. Yeah. Okay. So number two is feminists. And this is a tough one because, you know, it's, it's hard to find a woman that doesn't, that isn't a feminist, at least at a conscious level. So when you say feminist, what exactly do you mean? And, you know, what are some of the things that we can look for to spot that in a, you know, in an overt way? Yeah, the, I mean, the overt signs have become pretty obvious now. Purple hair, overweight, uh, covered in tattoos like a sticker book, you know, in random places. Um, these are the kind of gals that subscribe to beliefs uh, which require them to be a victim, okay? And if you're a victim in an equation, you have to have an oppressor. You have to have, be, you have, to have somebody that's doing you wrong. Well, the oppressor happens to be men for them. And I think feminism had noble roots in its cause where it was looking for equality. But I don't think many people today would argue that there's, that there's things that women can't do that men are doing, you know? Um, there's some people that say, oh, well, women are still getting paid 70 or 80 cents on the dollar for every dollar that a man makes, but they're not taking into effect that men work more dangerous jobs, longer hours. There's pushes to put women in the boardroom for Fortune 500 companies, but there's no pushes to put women on the back of garbage trucks or coal mines or oil rigs. Those are all predominantly jobs done by men, and they pay a lot more because they're longer hours and more dangerous. So it, it's a bit of a lie. Um, and I think at this point, you know, it's been said a few times now by several different people, it's not an equality movement anymore. It's more of a supremacy movement looking for the subjugation and the uh, bending of the knee to all women because of past manufactured traumas in many cases. Um, it's just not good to be in a long-term relationship with any woman that has a victim mindset as a baseline, like as a foundation, um, because victims are just awful to be around. They never take ownership for everything. It's always somebody else's fault. Um, if you have any disagreements in that relationship, it's always going to be your fault. There's, there's going to be no ownership taken on her part. So you, you mentioned that maybe feminism had uh, noble roots. Um, tell me more about that, you know, because there are those who argue that there's no such thing as good feminism. And if we're, you know, saying that refraining from the victim mindset is an important thing here, um, I'm curious how you how do you reconcile that with there maybe being a good feminism? Yeah, well, there's an example that I use in my book actually. Um, I think it was in the 1800s. I can't remember the exact date, but there was a law passed in London that prevented you from beating your wife after mm -hmm. certain after nine o'clock at night. I think it was, and the roots of it really weren't to protect women. It was because of noise pollution issues, and they didn't want to hear their neighbors beating their wives while her while she was screaming, sort of thing. So they. So they kind of started to adopt these things. It's like, well, why are we beating women? And I think that's a reasonable thing. Like, you know, why are we beating women, right? Like, is that absolutely necessary? Mm -hmm. Okay. Right. Yeah, I can see that. Number three, the unhappy and unlucky. So, um, you know, why, why would you want to stay, stay away from an unhappy woman? Oh, Yeah. The unhappy, the unlucky woman. You know, she's going to come home for work. She's going to be complaining about the part timer that shows up late, uh, doesn't do her job properly. She has to pick up the slack. Um, just, just everything. You know, there was that acronym that that popped up about twenty years ago in my life. It was FML, and that basically stood for F my life. Mm. Um, the unhappy, unlucky will go to that all the time. I'm just always unlucky. I'm un unluckily in love. I'm unlucky. I can't lose weight. I'm unlucky and I can't, I, I place an offer on the house that I wanted. I didn't get it. 
It's like nothing ever goes their way and it's wah, wah, wah. And it's this big cloud of negative energy that's around them. They're like energy vampires. They will suck the joy and happiness from your life. They're just so sad to be around. Um, I think it's one of Robert, uh, Robert Greene's uh, 48 rules of, um, or 48 laws of uh, power. Yeah. Um, staying away from people that are, that are in that mindset, it's just better. You, you, it's not just exclusive to women. I think it's exclusive to human beings in general. Stay away from people that are unlucky and always unhappy about something. Yeah. You know, I see this sometimes. And I think you do make reference to it, but there, you know, so, someone listening might say, why would anybody want to hang out with someone who's unlucky, unhappy? But there tends to be this instinct within some men. Uh, I, I think we all have it. How it shows up is different, but to then save this poor soul. Uh, what do you say to men that are, are attracted to these poor souls so that they can, you know, potentially lift them up? Yeah, I think men inherently want to protect and save women. So, you know, they call this dynamic the Captain save a dynamic <laughs> in the Mano Swamp, sure. um, which is, you know, just a funny way of, of sort of put it, putting it because a lot of these women, they're, that's just who they are, right? Um, it's, it's, it's part of our nature as men to want to protect weaker women, you know, right. weaker beings, you know, like sure. weaker beings. This is why we accept refugees into, you know, certain countries, uh, based on their story or their never narrative, why they're leaving. This is why we send food to starving children in Africa when they show us those videos on TV, because we want to protect, we want to preserve, we want to better things. And women are just part and parcel of that. So, um, the thing that men need to understand is I think you have to set strong and firm boundaries around you and the people outside of your inner circle, because if you invite the wrong person into your life, you can complicate it unnecessarily. So being, being a kind man is good. Being a nice guy that's a pushover, that's more of a Captain save -a that's where you run into problems. This is where you run into trying to save women, or you get guys that will wife up a gal that's got four kids from three different fathers, a whole right. bunch of debt. You know, like these guys swoop in routinely and will give up their life savings and their opportunity to father their own children to raise another man's children and, and, and bail her out. It's very common. Yeah. I mean, we, there's so many, you are, you have a whole chapter on dating, um, single mothers. So I don't want to get too deep yeah. into that, but definitely a problem that we see. And, uh, one that a lot of people would argue, you know, say, oh, you're supposed to help these women, but who, who was there to tell her to stop making them bad decisions? I get it. Right. Red flag number four. Let's, cause we got 20 of them. So let's rock. Uh, yeah. so I see this one a lot, man. And, and I would say that, you know, in, in many cases, this is probably the prime reason why men are complaining in their marriages is because she competes with you. So a woman that competes with you is not one that you want to have a relationship, right? Yeah. I mean, if a woman's going to compete with you, if she's going to, Hey Elliot, my car is better than yours. Hey Elliot, I've got 10 foot ceilings in my place. You only have eight foot ceilings, you know? Why did you buy such a crummy house sort of thing? Um, your life will be miserable. You know, she, she's, she's going to be difficult to be around. And that's one of the telltale signs of the avatar of this boss girl, which we see very predominantly today. A lot of girls have gone out there. They've gotten their degrees. They frame them in mahogany. They have little letters after the name on the degrees signifying their importance to what they do. They climb right. the corporate ladder. They put off having families and raising children until well into their 30s, sometimes even 40s, they freeze their eggs because they have important things to do. And w one of the consequences of that mentality, of that mindset, is they tend to compete with the men in their life. Um, I've seen this before. Like I've dated a couple of professional gals where they had uh, siblings growing up, usually brothers or even sisters. Um, but I saw it mostly with brothers where they would compete with their brothers growing up. And if you've got a a gal that you're dating and you discover that she competed with her brother growing up, she's probably going to pull that stuff on you as well, too. Uh, it might seem cute, cute or fun, like a little bit of a fun jab here and there where you have a little bit of playful banter. But when it turns into competition and mocking, it's going to go down a, mm -hmm. a bad path. At the end of the day, guys, a woman has to look up to you. She wants to be with a giant. She wants like a woman that sees you as her hypergamous best option as a giant in her life will not try to compete with you. She will want to complement your life, not compete in it. You know, you say something also, I think in this chapter or another one, 
where you say that, you know, men date down and that, you know, it might be a good idea to do so. What do you mean by that? Um, men tend to date down just because they prioritize access rather than values, right? Whereas a woman prioritizes, see, because women look at men as success objects and men look at women as beauty slash sex objects. So for a man, his priority is access. You know, it, it, does she like me? Will she touch my pee pee? Basically, right? Whereas for a woman, she's looking at a guy, especially when she's done with her party years, is is this guy successful? Can he provide? Does he have decent genes? You know, should I have a family with him? These are the sorts of you know questions that she's contemplating then. Red flag number five: she keeps men around from her past. Yeah. So what's wrong with having guy friends, men that she's no longer in relationship with, but they're just friends? Yeah. Nobody bangs more wives and girlfriends than he's just a friend. <laughs> um, you should be concerned if she keeps men around from her past. You should be concerned if she has especially dated or been intimate with a guy from her past and she just wants to catch up with him every once in a while and have mm. lunch or dinner or whatever it happens to be. Um, they hang out as friends. There's, there's a big lie that's sold to society today. I think through Hollywood culture and marketers, you know, manipulating us for decades now that men and women can be friends. And I would argue that men and women don't have a lot of similar interests and men and women shouldn't be friends, especially if you're in a committed relationship. Uh, that's like me taking my exotic car and parking it in a crappy neighborhood overnight and hoping nothing bad happens. Maybe nothing bad will happen, but why would I park it in a lousy neighborhood when I can lock it in my garage where it's nice and safe? And I'm not saying that you're in ownership of your woman or of her life, but you should remind her that if she's going to choose you, because you definitely want to choose women that choose you. You don't want to be chasing women that aren't interested in you. Choose women that choose you. You know, if she comes out and she says, Elliot, where do we stand? I dig your vibe. We've been, you know, we've been dating for a while. I don't want to share you. I want to claim you. That's at the point where you should take a good look at look at her and ask yourself, okay, well, take a look at the red flag chapter. First of all, there's 20 of them there. Uh, does she keep guys around from her past? You know, ha has she talked about getting lunch with exes? Has she talked about grabbing coffee with exes? Because that's not a good sign. You don't want to put your gal around other guys because guys don't really have a strong interest in being friends with women. And here's a test that you can use to prove it. If a woman says, oh, well, he's just a friend, mm -hmm. say, okay. Pass me your cell phone. Let's text him right now and say, I'm horny. I'd love to get with you. What do you think? Do you think that he's going to repel that advance or do you think he's going to accept it? 100% of the time, he will accept it. I guarantee you. Yeah, fat chance. And I love the way that you use the analogy of putting your car in a bad neighborhood because there are those that would argue, oh, what are you, insecure? Right? Oh, you must you must not be secure in your uh, your masculinity. Well, secure or not, I, even if I had an alarm, I wouldn't leave my car in a bad neighborhood, right? That's something I value. I'm not going to expose it to that which would steal it or ruin exactly. it. Exactly. I mean, if if a woman wants you to care about her, I mean, if I'm to care about a woman, if I'm to protect her, if I'm to take her out to dinner and dine her, then I, then I need to know that she's mine, right? That she's not going to do things that are going to put the relationship at risk. Like, I don't know, hang out with guys that she used to bang. Red flag number six, if she's poor with money. And so what exactly do you mean by that? That she doesn't have much or she's in debt? Who do we avoid? Yeah, so for those of the, you that don't know, I used to run a, a debt negotiation company for about 20 years here. It still exists in Canada. But um, I'm, I'm very attuned to financial instruments in the financial world. And I think it's smart as a guy, if you're going to make a choice to invite a woman into your life, to just stay away from women that are bad with money. Um, their financial habits will get infused into your life the closer you become. If you're going to make this woman the mother of your children and she can't balance a book or she's got a hundred grand in debt and has nothing to show for it, but a closet full of handbags and shoes, uh, she will be spending your money in the same fashion and causing problems. And there'll be downstream consequences to you, your family and your own children. So I think it's incredibly important to vet women from the perspective of how are they with finances? Are they willing to, uh, and they don't need to have an immense amount of wealth, but are they willing to enter your frame and agree to a budget and the boundaries that you might set for them if she's going to be a stay-at-home mom and raise the kids? Right. 
absolutely. If you're going to be trusting her with your money, she should be responsible with it. I got to say, it's probably one of the, I, there are a lot of great things about my wife, but one is her responsibility with the funds. She doesn't go and spend frivolously. She doesn't rack up debt and she spends only on things that enhance the family or enhance my attraction to her. I love long dresses. So she'll spend, spend on those. <laughs> so if she's spending to please you, well, that's a, that's amazing. So that's number, mm -hmm, go ahead. Go ahead. Red flag number seven. This is crazy. I, you know, because a lot of people would say, is this a real thing? But we're seeing so much of it. Violent women. I grew up with an uncle who his wife would beat him and threw plates at him. And he was in a hospital a couple of times. Um, and now you're seeing like YouTube videos where these women, they believe it's their right. I think it seems almost like there, there should be no consequence for their attacking men. And I think a lot of it comes from, I started watching a couple of movies this year. Uh, I don't watch very many movies, but I watched like movies from the eighties for Christmas because mm -hmm. we didn't, we don't have cable here. We're, so it was like, let's buy some DVDs. And I was shocked at the amount of time a woman would just slap a man in a movie. Mm -hmm. And so now we're seeing this out in the streets. Uh, definitely an obvious one, but tell me more about why it has to be on this list here. Violent women. Yeah, well, I mean, like one of the big problems with that is that because men are bigger and stronger generally than women, not always true, but generally speaking, you know, men are bigger and stronger than women. Mm -hmm. um, when you have a domestic violence call to the authorities and the police come to your house, it's generally you as a man that's going to get pulled away in handcuffs if there's been any physical alt altercation. Um, you've got the burden of performance in life to put a dent in the universe and do something with yourself. And you can't be doing something with yourself, being productive. Uh, if you're dealing with a woman that's violent, throwing things at you, stabbing you, uh, like I've, I've heard and seen all kinds of versions of this and you get locked up, you get completely derailed. The last thing you want to do is have children with a violent woman. Absolutely not. Uh, it is, it is one of the biggest in fact, if I had to pick one of the biggest red flags out of a list of 20, I would say violent women's probably the number one. Yeah. I, I don't think too many people would argue with that one. There's absolutely no rhyme or reason why a woman should lift her. There's, yeah. And there's no second chance. It's like once she shows you who she is and she's clearly a violent person, done. You're out. That's it. There's no, there's no negotiation. There's no get therapy. There's none of that stuff. Don't let your problems become my problems. If you allow that into your life, you, you need to set higher standards for yourself. Yeah, I agree. Uh, red flag number eight, you say extreme jealousy. Uh, yeah. I'm happy that you put that there because I, I tend to believe that there's a healthy dose of jealousy. Like yes. I, I don't want my wife to not care if I'm out, right? Um, but extreme jealousy is kind of a different thing. Explain that. Extreme jealousy is, it's just taxing on a man's life. Like, you know, like you said, you want her to care. You want her to feel a little bit of competition anxiety. I mean, after all, if other women don't look at you or show indicators of interest of you, then she's going, then her interest in you will wane as well, mm -hmm. surprisingly. Um, one of the times that women are most attractive, attracted to a man, and I've seen this firsthand several times, is um, if you're at a speaking gig or at a conference or something like that and you deliver a talk and you get a standing ovation as a room full of a lot of people and she's standing in the back there and guys approach you and they want to shake your hand and take pictures of you, like, you know, women like men that have been pre-selected by others, whether that includes men or women, it doesn't matter, but they like men that have been pre-selected by others. But it becomes a problem when she turns into a predator drone and she's watching your every move going through everything that you do, your documents, tracking devices on you, uh, going through your pockets, looking at receipts. What did you eat when you went out to lunch on that meeting? Oh, there's a salad on that. Was that a girl or was that a guy? You know, sort of thing. Uh, stuff like that gets a little bit toxic and exhausting for guys. And I recommend staying away from women that have extreme jealousy issues, extreme control issues in that regard. Hmm. Okay. Like a healthy boundary would be Elliot, I don't want you to have dinners alone with a woman. That would make sense. Sure. Okay. Yeah. You know, a potential, you know, solution to that is, well, this is a business dinner, so I'm going to bring my partner along or I'll bring you along, you know, for this dinner so we can complete this deal. Right. That would be a healthy solution to that. Yeah. I like that. So red flag number nine, 
this is going to be a tough one for the young guys, but I guess you got to put women in the category that they choose, right? Which is party girl. And so, you know, party girls might be good for parties, but we're vetting for relationships. Why don't we want to be in a relationship with a party girl? Yo, it's your bro, Elliot Hulse here. And if you're seeing this ad, it's because I want to help you. If you're a married man who owns a business but struggle to overcome those late night vices that you're trying to hide from the world, including your wife, clients, and colleagues, whether it's drinking, drugs, overeating, or viewing filth on your phone, all these vices that you're trying to hide, you know they're killing you on the inside, plus crippling your business and failing your family. If you're ready to destroy vice and dominate life, then click the link in this YouTube ad. Because for the first time in my 17 years on YouTube, I have a program that not only makes men strong, but has the power to fix families, repair businesses, and restore faith in a world gone wild. But it all starts with men like you who are ready to take action. Now, I don't have enough time to explain how it works here in this short clip, which is why I put together a four minute video for you to watch on exactly how it works. So click the link here, watch the video now, it's completely free. And if you're ready to destroy vice and dominate life, be the man that you're called to be, I'll see you on the inside. Done. Well, you know, party girls that get involved in alcohol, smoking, drugs, promiscuity, late nights, uh, it does a number on their body too. I mean, if you ever see a woman uh, who, who spent a lot of time consuming drugs, staying up, not sleeping, loud music, uh, sleeping with a lot of guys, she's aged a lot faster than a woman of the equivalent age that didn't do any of those things. So um, you know, dealing with the optics of attraction, I think it's an important thing to contemplate, but at the same time, why would you want to get involved in a long-term relationship with a woman who's going out every weekend partying? She's spending hours putting on makeup, dresses, push-up bras, doing her hair and makeup and nails and everything, getting together with her girls for the pre-drinks, the after-drinks, the dancing. It's, it's, it's an entire process to market herself to the world. Whether she acknowledges it or not, that's what she's doing. She's, she's getting ready and preparing to show herself off to the world, which gives the world an opportunity to approach her and say, hey, girl. You're looking good tonight. I like that you point out how quickly it ages them. Uh, men and women definitely age differently. Uh, it definitely has a harder toll. It takes m much more out on a woman, especially if she's partying uh, when she's young. I mean, it catches up. And, you know, by late 20s, you could tell right away that she's been uh, using a lot of substances, drinking a lot, smoking, and not sleeping well at night. So. Yeah. Health is definitely one part of it. And of course, obviously, she's out there you know, perhaps looking for more male attention, right? Do I want a woman that's craving that or do I want her to crave mine only? Exactly. So red flag number 10. This is a tough one, man, because now like half the women, maybe more out there, are heavily tattooed and pierced mm -hmm. up. I was uh, at a restaurant with my family the other day. And uh, all the waitresses, I mean, they were all at least 40 pounds overweight, but beyond that, had tattoos over all their arms. There was one girl, the girl that served us, that had zero tattoos. And you could tell her character, beyond just the image of being pure without tattoos, was totally different than the others. I think it says a lot about who someone is on the inside. But speak to us about you know tattoos and piercings as a red flag. Well, I think tattoos, you know, they've been around for a long too, long time too, right? Um, a lot of men have tattoos. You've got tats. Um, I think it's more of a masculine sort of uh, endeavor. Mm -hmm. It's, it, you know, for a lot of men, it could be a rite of passage. It could be a tribal thing for them. Mm -hmm. It's never, as far as I've seen in the history that I've studied, been a traditional behavior of women. Right. Um, it seems to be a masculine pursuit. So, we see a general trend of the masculinization of females and the feminization of males today, especially over the last several decades. And a woman covered in tattoos, I mean, look, if it's something sweet, uh, you know, if it's because she's committed to you and she tattoos your name around her ring finger or somewhere on her body uh, because she's that serious about you, okay, fine. Um, you know, in my view, that, that would be acceptable. But if you meet a gal and she's got tattoos all over her body in random places like a sticker book. Yeah. Um, my advice would be just, look, s stay away from her. I mean, date her if you want, but don't invite her into your life on a long-term basis. The other thing, too, is tattoos, they don't look that great as they age as well, too. You know, they sort of sp spread out and bleed, and 
you know, the girl with that cute butterfly tattoo on her shoulder blade, you know, that you meet when she's 21, uh, that's going to look like a pile, you know, like a bird crapped on her shoulder by the time she's 45. Yeah. It's interesting because, you know, this is sort of a new thing, as you said, like women never had tattoos and even the amount of tattoos that men have now, I grew up in the eighties and, uh, my dad was from Belize, kind of like a, uh, he was like a gangster. Uh, and he was the only dad with tattoos. My dad was known as the guy with the tattoos. They thought my dad was, uh, you know, a drug lord or something like that. And so my dad was known as the guy with the tattoos. Now, not only does everybody have tattoos, but everybody and their mama has tattoos. And I like how you point out that it's like the heavily tattooed, like neck and arms yeah. throughout the whole. It gets, life. it does get trashy, you know? And I, like I go to some formal events where you have to dress well. And if it's in the summertime, it's hot. So there's more skin exposed, especially with women with their evening gowns. And everybody gives side eye to girls, to women with tattoos, exposed tattoos and a nice evening gown. They just do. It's, it's you, you know, you look at it and you think to yourself, I do anyway. That's like putting bumper stickers all over a Lamborghini. A woman is a thing mm -hmm. of beauty. Why would you go and put bumper stickers all over a thing like a Lamborghini? You, it, it's just not tasteful. You know, the, what, this is kind of just my weird thinking on it too, but she had to lay down and be penetrated by a man for several hours mm -hmm. in order to receive that marking on her body. Like that guy yeah. basically, he tattooed you by penetrating you several times over hours yeah there's yeah there's something else i should add which i didn't include in in the chapter which i came to realize after the fact because i had a guy contact me and he was a tattoo artist and i had several tattoo artists contact me after that in fact and we all had very similar conversations I, and i did some podcasts with them uh a lot of these tattoo artists that tattoo women they do become intimate with them so when you see a woman covered with tattoos chances are pretty high that she laid with him right there's something very intimate about laying there allows the to penetrate you and leave yeah. their mark big one okay so uh in complete contrast in a way right tattoos are very obvious red flag number 11 maybe there are some signs or maybe there are some things we can look for to distinguish a woman with a high notch count meaning have had lots of sexual partners correct yeah, so this one is one that really upsets women because they can't turn back the clock on this. Once it's done, it's done. Um, you know, they can try to dismiss it. Well, why can men do it, but women can't do it? Well, again, you know, men and women are different and promiscuity in women affects them to a far greater degree than it does men. They've done studies on this. There's a very uh, popular study called the Teachman Study. Um, and I think they stopped collecting the data after about 21 partners. And I think 21 partners in today's world is actually pretty conservative. If you're, if you're talking to a woman or dealing with a woman over 25 or 30, she's probably laid with more than 21 uh, men. But anyway, they stopped collecting the data at 21. And what they found was a woman that's a virgin bride has about an 82% chance of being happy in a marriage with a man. Uh, I think it's about seven or eight years down the road, reported anyway. Um, and the more partners that she's been with, and it's a bouncing bar graph, it kind of goes down like this, but the, but the trend is down. Basically the more guys that she's been with, the higher probability is that she's going to be unhappy. And there's other issues that come with that. I mean, if she's been with more guys, the higher probability that she's had abortions, the higher probability she's got an STD, the higher probability she has a, uh, mental disorder, or she's on some kind of meds to sort of medicate it or placate it. Uh, the biggest risk that exists beyond all of that and the absolute disgust that most men tend to realize exists when they picture a woman laying with 50 or 100 other guys prior to them is that if you're going to raise a family and have kids or even if you're going to be in a long-term relationship, uh, if a woman's been through a lot of guys, a lot of relationships, it's very easy for her to leave and exit. So she's not very sticky to you. You know, she doesn't... she. A woman that has conflict in a relationship that's been with a lot of guys would just say, I'm out because I can just find somebody else. I had this conversation the other day with a, a, a close friend and he's read my book. He's known about me for a long time because we're friends and he overlooked the notch count thing. He actually came to me and he said, hey, look, Rich, I think you need to add runners to your list. And I said, what do you mean by runners? He goes, you know, women that run at the first sign of conflict or problems. So I, went, so I kind of rewound. And I said, well, explain to me what she's about. 
and let's go through the red flags with you. And, he, and he's like, right. hey, okay, well, there's the notch count thing. I'm like, okay, well, what do you think the notch count is? <laughs> he says, well, she, she couldn't identify it. You know, we had the conversation. It was, it was too many to name. So I'm like, what do you think that means? 20, 50? He goes, well, the last time we broke up, she basically contacted every guy that she's ever been with to try to line them up to placate herself to get the attention that she needed. So he said, runners are a potential red flag. But I argued, I said, look, the reason why she's a runner is because she's promiscuous and it's easy for her to leave if there's conflict in the relationship. Because if it's been 21 guys and you're number 22, she doesn't care. She'll make it 23, 24, 25, right? There's, there's no intention to maintain purity in that dynamic, which is why when she's unhappy, she'll just find the next guy because she knows it's easy. I think I learned the term pair bonding from uh, watching your videos. Is this a thing? Is this where, uh, is this a real thing where a yeah. certain amount of, after yeah. a certain amount of men, a woman lacks the ability now to pair bond, which is pair bond different. in a healthy and happy way, right? What does Again, that mean you know, like, to pair what? Bond? Well, if you've been with a woman that's, we'll just use 50, we'll use something random like that. You know, if you've been with a woman that's been with 50 guys, the chances of her having abortions, the chances of her having a lot of baggage along the way is is there. It exists versus a woman that might have spent her entire 20s with one guy and maybe he was a total POS and she had to end it and now she's with you or she's a virgin bride, for example, let's say. Um, she's she just got a lot of baggage. So the example that I use is if I were to take a Sharpie marker and grab a clay brick and write on it, he hurt me, put that in the burlap bag. He threw me down the stairs, put that in the burlap bag. He abandoned me when I got pregnant. Put that in the burlap bag. I had to have an abortion. Put that. It's like a big burlap bag full of bricks and she carries around and it's invisible and nobody sees it right. except for her. She knows that it's there. It exists. And she doesn't tend to recognize, sorry, reconcile all of those bad choices in her life. And she carries this around. And now she carries this heavy bag of bricks around into your life as you invite her into it. And you're dealing with the trauma and past issues that she's had. So it's not just the disgust of her laying with many men. It's not just you know mm -hmm. potential for an SCD, uh, all of those things. There's there's a lot of compounding issues there. And look, if you're dating and you know, you're spending place, whatever it is that you happen to be doing to sort of, you know, figure out women, that's fine. But if you discover that she's been promiscuous, I would not invite her into my life. It's 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 just a bad choice. Yeah. I wouldn't argue with that. Um, my question though is no one's walking around with a scarlet letter. How right. do you know? How you know, are there any subtle signs or symptoms of a woman who has a high notch count? You know, if you ask her directly, people argue that you should just double or triple whatever number she gives you. Right. Okay, is a is an easy way to do it because women will tend to uh, like they'll recall long longer term relationships. They'll recall the three month guy that she dated, the seven month guy, the three year relationship. She'll recall all of that. What she doesn't tend to recall is, well, what happened in Vegas stays in Vegas. What happened at the foam cannon party in Ibiza stays there. Mm -hmm. The threesome encounters, the lesbian encounters, the guy that she gave a blowjob to at the back of the nightclub. Um, she doesn't recall those numbers. So that's why they say, well, you can double or triple whatever number she, she gives you. So if it, if it starts looking like promiscuity, like if it walks like a duck and it quacks like a duck, it's probably a duck. A lot of the red flags over here, by the way, um, sort, of, sort of are indicators of promiscuity. She's had daddy issues. She's a feminist. Like for you to be a feminist, you have to think that men and women are identical. And one of the beliefs that women have is, well, if men can be promiscuous, then women can be promiscuous now because we have birth control. We can do whatever we want, right? So a, a feminist woman is typically quite promiscuous, whereas a more conservative woman isn't. So a lot of those on the list of the red flags are good identifiers, but a simple way to be, you know, at some point down the line when you're dating, curious, you know, how many guys have you been with? And then just shut up and let her talk and let her say whatever she wants. She might downplay it. She might not answer the question directly. A more difficult way to assess it would be to just watch her lifestyle behavior. So you meet a woman, she's 33. Hey, what'd you do with your twenties? Well, you know, I backpacked around Europe. I worked on cruise ships. Uh, I worked at a nightclub, uh, did some promotion work. Uh, I was, uh, working in Ibiza for three years. You, you can, you know, you can rest assured that she's been with a lot of dudes. If you take a look at her Instagram and she doesn't have a lot of money, but you see a lot of photographs on yachts, private jets, boats, supercars, 
-hmm. Well, guess who's paying for all that, right? Uh, you know, in exchange for the photograph, for that opportunity to be in that photograph, there's, there's a guy that typically pays for that. And it's not always the same guy usually. Okay. Those are, those are helpful. Red flag number 12, single mothers. What's wrong with a single mother? She, maybe she just made a mistake or, uh, you know, she needs help too. Like, uh, shouldn't we save her? That's what they want you to believe, don't they? Yeah. Um, so I have an entire chapter in my book that deals with single mothers because I think it's such a difficult um, conversation to have. And I'm speaking from experience because, you know, been there, done it, you know, got it, got the t-shirt. Uh, you're in a position where you essentially choose to cuckold yourself. Uh, and if you don't know what that means, that means that you're raising children that aren't biologically yours. The reason why we are on this earth today is to scatter our seed and pass on our DNA, our name, our legacy, and all that sort of stuff. And if you choose to abandon an opportunity to do that, to raise another man's seed and provide for them, then you're essentially a cuck. You also have a number of other issues, which are deep in the chapter, so you guys have to read for that, but I'll cover another one, is that you have res parental responsibility to children that you have to raise and, and protect and provide for and take on vacations and dinners and birthdays help zero in little Billy's scope on his BB gun. You do all of these things, but you don't generally have any authority over them. You have responsibility to them, but you don't have any authority over disciplining them. And if you do try to discipline them, quite often what most guys find happen is they hear some version of, you're not my father, you can't tell me what to do, and they throw a hissy fit. And mom, of course, will then side with the bratty child rather than doing what's right. Yeah. You know, even with my own children, my wife and I, and she makes it a point to put me ahead of the children. And I do the same thing for her. She always, her opinion, of course, she's my teammate in this. But it seems as if when there's someone else's child involved, that child goes before you as her husband or whatever. Correct. Yeah, bad deal. Um, yeah, like you said, it's a tough one. Is there a lot of guys that find themselves in this situation and maybe find out a little too late that this was a bad idea? And, you know, guys want to protect, they want to provide, they want to save, yeah. but uh, not at the expense of uh, what there you was a There was an era where it was shameful to be a single mother. Right. Uh, if you were a single mother 500 years ago, uh, you would generally be banished or you might even be forced to work in a brothel, you know, for example, to sort of, you know, provide for your child. Um, mm. so it was, so it was frowned upon today with culture and society, Hollywood and media, it's like, you know, it's celebrated. Oh, you're so strong and brave. You know, on father's day, you'll hear women on social media, you know, let's, let's praise all those single mothers cause they're doing the jobs of the mothers and the fathers, you know, sort of thing. Um, and I don't think that it's good for society, for culture or for the world in general, because I mean, the statistics are very clear, um, children that are incarcerated vast majority of them come from single mother households. Children that run away from home, vast majority of them single mother households, poor right. grades, single mother households, uh, gang activity, uh, teenage pregnancies. I go right down the list. Uh, the absence of fathers in a household is a terrible thing for children. Now, some guys might say, well, then I'll step up and I'll, and I'll take care of it. Okay, well, you can, but you've also cucked yourself now, and now you're not raising your own kids, right? So right. Um, th there's a lot of women out there that bring children in tow, there's a lot of guys that send me screenshots of dating apps and are like, take a look at this, Rich. I can't believe this is happening. And it's like a 25-year-old and her profession is stay-at-home mom in the description. And she's got three kids from three different fathers. And she's pregnant in her Bumble advertisement for men. And this is accepted. This is normalized. Right. You know, go girl. You go, girl. You're so strong and independent. And, guy, and because there's so many simps out there, they'll swoop in and they'll... They'll sign up for it. You know, so as far as, you know, the deplorable statistics of the uh, the outcome for children that are raised by single mothers, I read recently that there are the exact opposite uh, statistics for children that are raised by a single father. Correct. Usually Isn't that interesting? Better. <laughs> right. That interesting. Yeah. It's the exact opposite of what we're told in our, you know, in our culture and what the courts will propose that. The child needs a mother. No, in fact, they fare better with just a father. Yeah. Crazy. Crazy backwards world we live in. Cool. So red flag number 13. So women seeking validation. What do you mean by that? Don't most women seek validation? 
Yeah, there's um, there's a meme somewhere where men tend to use things like cell phones like this, where they'll take pictures of th- like cars, landscapes, the Grand Canyon when they're traveling sort of thing. Women, on the other hand, they'll turn the, the camera around and they'll do the selfie. So they use their phone for completely different reasons. That's another strong example of how men and women are different. So women tend to use social media today to garner the follows, the likes, and the attention of guys for their, whether it's OnlyFans or their Instagram, you know, account, whatever it is they're looking for. Uh, but again, you know, let's say that you're at the point where you're dating uh, a gal and she says, Elliot, I dig your vibe. I want to claim you. I don't want to share you. You should take a good look at her, take a good look at her social media presence and see what she's been doing with it. And if you find out that she's been posting photographs of herself, sometimes promiscuous photographs of herself, sometimes they'll even use photographs that you've taken of her with you cut out of the photograph or something like that. Uh, Yeah. So, you know, if she's been out there posting uh, sexy, provocative pictures of herself, an easy response would be, well, I like you too, but I can't take a woman seriously if she's out there seeking the attention and validation of others on social media. You want to claim me? fine. You need to stop this behavior. You know, you're either going to cancel your Instagram, shut it down, make it private, but this is going to stop, right? That's, that's your opportunity to put your foot down and lay down the frame of the relationship because that's really the only time you can do it. I mean, you can't do it three years in, you know, if she's been doing it and getting away with it and you say, you know what, you need to stop this because I saw this video with Elliot and Rich and he said that, you know, seeking validation is not a good thing. So we need to cut this off. Uh, that's when she's going to call you controlling, manipulative. She's going to complain to her friends and maybe even, you know, bounce on that relationship. So it's, it's something you have to catch early on. You have to identify early on, but women don't even know that they're doing it because it's common today. Everybody has social media, but people don't understand why they're using social media. Uh, she's getting DMS from guys. Most of them are thirsty nerds. They're, you know, just, just geeks that aren't going to crank her wheel, but the fact that she's getting thousands of likes or comments or you're so beautiful girl or DMs from guys over and over again, even if it's guys that she doesn't like, she has an elevated overestimation of her value on the sexual marketplace and has a belief of entitlement. You don't want a woman walking around with a big head, right? Um, you know, be beautiful, take care of yourself. But mm-hmm. if, but it, if we're going to be together, you're mine. Like, let's just make that clear. You're not sharing these photographs that I should be seeing with everybody out there to consume. And at some point, she might get hit on by some high value uh, guy, right. and she might have an opportunity to entertain that, you know, if you permit it. So, hmm. you know, I was thinking about your point about how men take pictures of things, women take pictures of themselves. I think they're going to do it regardless. Uh, and so, what are they taking pictures of themselves with? I think it made me what really. Uh, made this go off in my head was that they cut out the picture of you in their picture. You know, even my wife, like me and the kids, we're, we're always like rolling our eyes because she constantly wants to take pictures, but it's of the family. It's she and I, it's with the children. It's And so I tend to see that there are a lot of women who are married with children and the pictures that are on their profile are them. Yeah. Oftentimes it might be them with their baby, just, you know, trying to get, Absolutely like, get fine. validation from other women that I have a baby. But then I ask myself, well, where's your husband? Yeah. So when it gets to the point, like you'll start to notice this. So once you see this, you can't unsee it. I'm sorry. I'm going to ruin this for some people right now, but you'll see this around Valentine's day anniversaries where there'll be a social media post from a guy and he'll say, she's my everything. She's, uh, you know, without her, I would be nothing, uh, blah, blah, blah. She's a great mother of my kids, f- best friend, all this sort of stuff. And there's tags and posts of her, her, you know, looking beautiful on the beach in some outfit or something like that. Cause he's trying to say basically, you know, my wife's hot or, you know, my wife's hot and check out my great kids sort of thing. And that's fine. But if you click through on who he's tagging and then you see the other side of the equation and that doesn't exist, like that's not reciprocated. She's not saying, you know, mm-hmm. I've been with this man for 10 years. He's the best thing I've ever had, the best choice I ever made. It's just a picture of her still on her profile on the beach with her girlfriends from her girls weekend away, drinking their pinatas or whatever it is that they're putting back. Uh, that's, that's questionable. That is to me a sign that the clock is potentially kick, uh, uh, ticking down to the end of that relationship. Um, so when you watch the behaviors that are used online on social media, you can have a pretty good picture of the health of that relationship and where it's going. Yeah. 100%. So red flag number 14 
she was a sugar baby. What is yeah. that? Sugar baby, OnlyFans creator, um, any any one of those things. She's basically selling her sexuality to other guys for money, and it's usually simp's or older guys, you know, with cash that want to that either want to take care of her or want to pay for her company. Um, it's prostitution. You know, there's no other way to s state it. It's she's basically a hooker. Um, and if you want to invite a woman like that into your life, then don't expect to have a a, a simple, pleasant life. You're you're going to be dealing with baggage. You're going to be dealing with problems. If a woman's chosen to sell herself, and you know they they try to justify it in any number of ways. Well, I'm a digital creator. No, you sell pictures of your butthole on OnlyFans to nerds every single month, right. and that's how you make a living. Like this is you're going to argue that you're a digital creator, or it's or or it's something of that nature. Um, no man realistically wants photographs and a footprint out there of a woman that's demonstrated that she's not uh, private, you know, in some regard or or sense. Uh, it's it's disgusting, and men are inherently disgusted by it. So it's you know one of the telltale signs is a girl that's been on sugar dating sites or or has an OnlyFans. Um, not good. Bad sign for sure. Yeah. So essentially, women who are taking cash for showing their ass. Cash for ass. That's it. Prostitution. Great way to put it. Okay. Red flag number fifteen: pathological liars. And so I, you know, you use that word pathological. That means it's an illness of sorts that this person needs to lie uh, about everything. Is that right? Yeah. I mean, pathological liars are so dangerous, Elliot, because. I mean, look, if you're going to invite a woman into your life, again, girlfriend, wife, children, you know, whatever path you happen to choose, um, you want a woman that you can trust, that you can rely on, that uh, that you can, uh, you can uh, basically open yourself up to. Because at the end of the day, if you're going to be with her for a long period of time, you need that kind of partnership. And if she's, she's going to reveal herself to be a, a pathological liar, that's a major danger zone, man. I mean, it could be a danger zone from an early point where she says, oh, don't worry, I'm on birth control, just go inside me. I mean, she's not, and she might be trying right. to trap you. Yeah. Uh, it, you know, what, the the very first time that I came across this, I was quite young. This was my first girlfriend because I was 19. I used to ride a motorcycle at that time. And um, because she wanted to compete with me, in a sense, or in a regard, she said, well, I have a motorcycle too, but it's at my mom's house. Her, mm. her parents were... Uh, <laughs> divorced and i said oh okay well that's interesting so when are we going to go riding together like why don't we go get it so we can go for a rip and there was always a reason why uh, it's not available it's in storage uh my mom's boyfriend uh moved it to another building something for months and then s something didn't sit right elliot you know i was sitting there thinking to myself i think this this chick's lying to me she doesn't have a bike she's just doing this to try to look cool to sort of size things up uh you know maybe even to compete with me and I was filling up my car one day with gas, and I thought to myself, okay, well, the tank on my motorcycles, uh, I think it was 20 liters, so it would cost like five or six bucks to fill up at the time. And after I filled up the uh, the bike, I said to her, by the way, how much does it cost you to fill up your bike with gas? And she said, 20 bucks. And I said, there's no motorcycle on the market that has a tank big enough for you to put $20 worth of fuel in it. You don't have a bike, do you? And then she just broke down in tears and it's like, okay, what else did she lie about? She lied about a lot of other stuff. I figured yeah. out after that point, uh, you do not want a pathological liar in your life. You know, of course it would go both ways, but I think I remember hearing something about there's some sort of imperative, uh, reason why women lie a lot more than men. Like they have to protect themselves or, you know, it's more a matter of getting a reason is an important thing for them. Um, yeah. So, true. yeah. So women will tend to lie to preserve their value because again, men look at women as beauty slash sex objects. So they'll lie to preserve that value, even though they don't understand it. Like it's why they lie about their notch count. You know, for example, they won't volunteer the, what happened in Vegas stays in Vegas, the parties, the threesomes, the whatever. They don't volunteer that. And it's not like they're trying to hide it either, but all that they're going to is, is what makes sense. So Women will, will lie to preserve their value. Men will lie to uh, accentuate their value. That's why when guys are on dating apps, you know, they'll say six foot if they're five foot ten. 
That's why when they're on dating apps, they'll uh, try to portray or hold out to the public that they're successful and wealthy because they inherently know that women like that. So they'll take pictures around supercars. They'll take pictures around interesting places that they travel to sort of thing. Um, so that's how men and women lie differently. Right. Uh, just on the topic of pathological lies, like you pointed out, just look out for little lies. It's the little lies that lead to the big lies. Like, why did you lie about that silly little thing? Like, it wouldn't have made a difference if you told me the truth. And if you see those, that's breadcrumbs showing you. Yeah. A big lie yeah. What do they say? You know, how you do one thing is how you do everything sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, red flag number 16 baby rabies <laughs> it's a funny term I'm, I'm curious what do you mean by that what's a woman that has baby rabies yeah so a guy that's dated a woman in her 30s or early 40s that doesn't have kids will come across this a lot i think the older that women get um the more it happens where they just want to rush in and uh that's not a good thing so i did this breakdown the other day on a segment it's called ghosting and basically this guy was dating this girl for about three months and he just stopped talking to her. So she calls him to the radio station and she wants him to call the guy to find out why. And lo and behold, it's a baby rabies you know, story. So it goes down like this. Um, her sister is a, uh, a dentist, so she becomes an orthodontist. Her sister be, uh, buys a Jeep, so she buys a G-Wagon. Uh, her sister's moving in with her boyfriend and they're going to get pregnant soon. She is now telling this guy that he needs to move in and they have to get pregnant soon. Mm. She's only dated the guy for three months. You can't size up a woman after three months. We know we know people can act for a prolonged period of time. There's clinical psychologists that have suggested that you should wait about a year and a half um, you know, before you can really see the true person because you're generally dating the representative prior to that. So a woman that's saying, well, you know, I'm 35 and I don't have much time, so I got to rush into this, Bob. So we need to move in together and have kids and right. get started because my sister's doing it and all my girlfriends are doing it. It's like, well, her past bad choices and her life choices, you, you know, are a consequence of where she's at today. But that that is her problem. Her problem should not be your problems. You should take your time to vet her to see what she's made of. And if having children is something that's important to you, why are you dating a 38 year old woman that's at the end of a reproductive cycle? Date a younger woman that is more fertile that can, you know, provide those children for you if that's what you're looking for. Right. So a woman that has baby rabies, again, that's that's her problem. And she'll rush in to having children with just about any guy at that point that's willing to give it up for. Her. Um, and that's dangerous because you have children with a woman that's got baby rabies, she's only using you for your seed. She doesn't need you. She's a strong, independent woman, woman, generally speaking. She's a boss girl. So when things don't go her way, guess what's going to happen to your kids? Do you think you're going to see them all the time? It generally doesn't go that way, right? She's not going to say, oh, no, you have custody, or let's just split custody. It's kids mine, right? So give me some money now. Mm. Yeah, I could totally see that. I've seen that happen. And I've seen guys who have fallen in love with older women. It's like, and yeah. hey, you want a family, why are you doing that? It's, it's, it's for all the wrong reasons. Mm -hmm. it, you know, like it really, like she doesn't love you. She doesn't want to improve your life. She doesn't want to be a compliment to your life. She just wants your seed. Your genetics are good enough and you look like the kind of guy that can pay for stuff. Mm. Stay away from women with baby rabies. Amazing. I like that. Uh, <laughs> okay. Red flag number 17. Hissy fits. Mm -hmm. But she throws a hissy fit. So I'd imagine this is like how a toddler, you know, throws a fit when she doesn't get uh, got it. ice cream flavor she wants. Um, what does it look like when a grown woman throws a hissy fit? Uh, well, she's not able to communicate the difficulties that she's feeling and, you know, in her, in her heart and her mind in that, in that moment. So she'll just, she'll walk out on you. Um, she might start to become a little bit violent, throw things around, you know, sort of stuff. It usually looks like walking out and going silent. And, that can be pretty dangerous because if she can't sit down and have a conversation with you about a, a disagreement, and it happens a lot, by the way, if she has a lot of hissy fits and she walks out on you, you know, the whole runner thing we talked about earlier, usually promiscuous women, women that have been with a lot of guys, uh, that's, that's one of the consequences of women that have been promiscuous is they tend to throw hissy fits if they don't get their way. And they do it because they know they have options. They do it because they know they have the attention and validation or they have had the attention and validation of guys uh, online or they are, or they have a Rolodex on their phone, basically a box of dicks that they can just sort of go through. It's like, okay, let me hit this guy up next now. 
Uh, so hissy fits are not a good sign. My recommendation is if she can't deal with things in a productive fashion by having a nice conversation about it, and she just has a complete spaz or a meltdown or it, it escalates beyond that, just just leave her alone. You know, she's not for you. She's not for you long term. There's other women out there. It's interesting. I had a friend who was really attracted to Latin women for mm. the, for their exactly for that reason. Because they're like, spicy. Look, yeah, he says they're spicy, and I've watched her go bananas and i'm like why would you want that and it seems like some guys i don't know what it is but they're attracted to this spiciness what's up with those guys Are they just i don't know man I've, yeah i don't know i've thought about that i think that um a lot of the times guys will mimic relationships that they saw in their household growing up so if their mom was <laughs> difficult and threw hissy fits they might see an attraction to women like that in their adult life they might think oh well i can fix this one like i you know what I saw my dad go through. I can I can try to fix this in my own life. That's a good point. Red flag number eighteen. Okay, this is interesting. I'm not sure I understand, but it's not being in control of the birth. What does that mean? A woman that just says, "Let's just have sex. It's okay. Don't worry about it." Right? It's like okay, this like we've seen we've seen what happens to men when women get pregnant. And what they can do with family law to extract wealth from him. Um, there's a lot of warnings that have been published to professional athletes, for example, where they'll say, look, NBA team, we're in this town. We know that you're going to do what you're going to do. Make sure that if you do have sex with anybody, you use a condom and you flush it down the toilet because women have been known to go to the bathroom after having sex with a high value athlete like that, taking the condom out of the garbage and inseminating themselves. So you need to have full control of the birth if you're going to be intimate with a woman. Uh, again, this is not the path of Elliot Hulse, but I think this is the reality of the indulgence that men have today with women. And if you're going to do that, then make sure you control what happens with birth. Um, I don't think a vasectomy is the best path for men. Uh, mm -hmm. They're not always reversible. It's kind of a odd procedure, but some, but some guys will go for it after they've got their kids out of the way. But if you're a young man, just use condoms, you know, and be sensible about it, you know, throw them in the garbage. Um, an alternative to that is if you're in a long-term relationship and you're not uh, having children anytime soon, you committed to each other, whatever, uh, a IUD is a potential, you know, solution for that temporarily for like a year or two or something, something. but you don't want to prolong the use of birth control for too long because it has uh, issues on women's health. And if you're planning on having kids with a the woman, then you don't want to put her health at risk because it's obviously going to put your children's health at risk too. So in other words, take back the reins in terms of sex. Control. Yeah. Yeah. Take back control. Yeah. You know, and yeah. so I just referred to that statement uh, earlier, weaponized chastity. Like we decide where we're going to blow our loads or if we, if you even get our load. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we, I can see that. Yeah, it, it's, hey man, you know, it's your seed, it's valuable, so guard it. Amen. I can see that. Okay, great. I guess this one, number 19, how's uh, a drama queen different than a hissy fitter? Yeah, a hissy fit is like a physical, generally a physical removal of them, you know, from your, from your time, from your life, from your day with a bit of a blow up. Drama queen sort of like, it's just, she makes mountains out of molehills. Every small thing that you do, it bothers her or it triggers her because of some past item. And again, this is like one of the things that like it, one of the areas that guys sort of deal with a lot is, well, my ex did that and I see you doing things that look like what my ex did. So I'm going to be triggered by it and be a drama queen because because they, they want to nip it in the butt. Right? Like a lot of these boss girls, a lot of these boss bitches, they're they've been through a lot. They haven't reconciled a lot that they've been through. Right. So they'll make a big deal out of something that's not the same thing. Like, well, my ex used to throw me down the stairs after he raised his voice, right? Well, if I raise my voice because you're not listening to me, that doesn't mean that I'm going to throw you down the stairs. That just means that I want you to hear me, right? So making a big deal out of it, making a mountain out of a molehill is what a drama queen would do, right? So again, they're exhausting. They're very taxing to be around. It, it's it's just not a fun relationship. They're energy vampires. What percentage of women would you say lean towards being, you know, I just, it seems as if women tend to make mountains out of molehills, just generally speaking. Uh, 
how do you deal with that when a woman proposes it, right? You know, hey, this is a big deal. You know it's not. Do you just automatically say, ah, she's a drama queen and, you know, red flag her and kick her out? Or is there a way well, yeah. by which we can, you know, revert that or change that in her? Yeah, you can try to change. So a lot of these things, like you can try to change the behavior, right? I mean, you can't change tattoos. You can't change her mm -hmm. promiscuous past, you know, things like that. Mm -hmm. But somebody being a drama queen, making a big deal out of something. Um, let me just think of an example. So like, let's say that I do a podcast with a beautiful woman. You know, she invites me on her on her podcast. She wants to have a conversation with me, talk about the red flags sort of thing. If my girl would, well, you know, who is she and why are you doing it and why are you doing that one? And da, 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 it's like, okay, look, I'm just there for the conversation and I think that it's going to be interesting and that's it. I don't want to hear about it, right? There, nothing is happening, okay? Um, let's just move on. We're going to go get something to eat, so put on that black dress that I like. Let's go. Um, you don't you don't entertain it. I mean, if you if you fuel the fire, then it's going to grow, right? But if you put your foot down and say, I'm not going to, I'm not going to engage in this nonsense without saying I'm not going to engage this nonsense, but basically by way of your actions and your words and the choices that you handle it by, then you set that boundary and it becomes clear. Yeah. Yeah. Just don't, in, don't get embroiled with her argument. A lot of, yeah. A lot of dealing with women and even girls, like I know you've got girls too, is, is setting boundaries with them, you know, setting healthy boundaries and believe it or not, I believe anyway, that women like a strong, virtuous man that can set and enforce good boundaries. Um, they may not like it at the time. They might throw a little bit of a hissy fit, but they'll probably get over it. Yeah, I agree. I've seen that 100%. Uh, okay, great. So red flag number 20. Can't argue with this one. Love to hear how you uh, unpack it though. Addictions. Stay away from women that have addictions. And so what kind of addictions are you talking about here? And why is it about yeah. Doesn't matter if it's sugar, cigarettes, drugs, alcohol, mm. anything that's abused that owns them is going to be an addiction. It could be a shopping addiction. I used to date right. this woman that would go shopping and buy a whole bunch of uh, lamps and then try them all out on her nightstand and then return the ones that didn't look good on her nightstand to the store. Like that's a shopping addiction, right? Uh, any kind of addiction is going to be problematic in a long term relationship because. She can't, she can't control that. You know what I mean? Now there's healthy addictions, you know, like addictions to good health, addictions to good uh, food choices, addictions to exercise, providing it's reasonable. Like, you know, if she's a kind of woman that runs marathons back to back every single month sort of thing, and you know, her body's deteriorating as, as a result of that, uh, then that might be problematic, but you don't want to deal with a woman that's got a strong addictive personality. Yeah. Would you also agree that if you are struggling with an addiction, um, you should check that first before ever expecting her to overcome it? Yeah. Uh, I mean, this applies both ways. Like women shouldn't deal with guys that have a drinking problem. Women shouldn't deal with guys that just sit around and smoke weed all day and play video games, obviously. Um, but I think that they inherently know that because they always look for their hypergamous best option. If a guy isn't a winner, they generally stay away from them. Not always true. But like we've seen women choose absolute bums that are drunks and get knocked up by them and they end up in jail. Everybody's heard that story. Uh, but I think generally speaking, women make better choices when it comes to choosing men with addictions in their personality. But men will overlook it because again, men seem to prioritize access, right? If she chooses him and touches his pee, -pee then she's a good choice by default. Right. Now, okay, that's fine. You know, she, she likes you, but does she have red flags? Mm -hmm. And you got 20 of them to look out for here. I, mm -hmm. I like this list. I think it's a good list regardless of your intention, right? You know, Rich and I, uh, we agree on a lot of things, but there are a few things that we differ. If you're looking for a wife, I would agree with this. I'd say if, if you want long-term relationship or however you want to describe it, I'm sure anybody who watches Rich's video agree with it. And Rich, mm -hmm. you mentioned also too, man, um, I'm curious if, if you're open to discussing it before we sign off, I really don't pay too much attention to what's going on, you know, in the manosphere or, you know, between different creators. I'm just, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm that self focused. Like I don't really pay attention to anybody else. Um, but you did mention that there's been sort of a, a shift to change and maybe you don't identify so much with, um, you know, I guess the general manosphere. what's actually going on there for guys that are curious, like new, you know, is there a fallout? Is there a split or guys taking different, 
ideals? What's what's happening? Yeah, well, it's it's been going on for years now. Um, I mean, I was involved in some uh, online panel shows. I've done conferences several times. Um, that's how we, we met, actually. Um, <laughs> there's 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 always there always seems to be some conflict or drama, you know, between these men who want to portray themselves as alpha males, and mm. they're really just acting like women. You know, they're they're fighting amongst themselves, and you know, truthfully. I think in the words of Jack Donovan, and, you know, we both know him well, um, you know, the author of The Way of Man and Becoming a Barbarian, you know, he says, uh, you know, he mentions this uh, phrase, which is stuck from stuck with me for a few years now, is in the manosphere, and the reason why I call it the Mano Swamp, you're going to understand in a minute, mm. there's not a lot of good men or men that are good at being men. Um, I've, I've discovered working closely with many of them and seeing their inside li- lives, uh, you know, peeling back the curtain and sort of seeing what's what's going on there. Uh, again, not good men, not very good at being men. Uh, there was one public video that uh, Abba and Preach did recently on a character by the acronym MLD, which I'd worked with on a, t- on a not TV show, on a YouTube show called Rule Zero. And I always knew something was off about the guy. I didn't know what it was. And they showed evidence of him glassing women in a nightclub. Basically, uh, he was rejected by a girl purportedly, and he assaulted her. And these are guys that are trying to, you know, um, show you how to be a strong, virtuous man and get what you want out of life. Like these are your heroes. And if these are the guys that you worship, that's fine. I mean, if you get something out of it, good. But I would encourage you to take a closer look at the men that you worship because a lot of them are absolute and complete trash. There might be some good information out there, but I'll be honest with you guys. I've summarized it mostly in my book, The Unplugged Alpha. Um, I've got well over 200 podcast episodes, some of them with clinical psychologists, very interesting characters that have contributed some, lots of useful information. Uh, read Evo Psych, read, uh, David Buss's The Evolution of Psychology. It's a very, very good, uh, book on why women do what they do. There's another book that he collaborated on with another author called Why Women Have Sex. Um, you know, empirical studies are all there and presented, uh, for you. By the way, if you want to get the 20 red flag chapter, if I, if I can plug it, Um, it's free. You can just opt into my email list. Just go to entrepreneursandcars.com forward slash red dash flags, and you can download it for free. Nice. Awesome. Rich, I really appreciate you taking some time to join me today, man. Thanks, brother. Appreciate it, man. Yeah, I appreciate your work, and uh, I'm sure we'll talk again soon. Absolutely. All right, brother. And thank you, and thank everybody for watching. Thanks, man. Bye-bye.